NordVPN and Surfshark have merged, Facebook has taken a massive hit, the Earn It bill has returned, and there's some exciting FOSS news. Lots more, welcome to Surveillance Support 74, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news. This report recaps some of the most notable, notable events in the last week. I'm Henry from TechLore. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And this week's promo is Simple Login. We just uploaded a video on TechLore about private email providers. Check it out if you haven't. And one thing that really should be added to your email game is probably an aliasing solution if your email provider doesn't offer one. Aliasing allows you to pretty much hand out individual emails to every service you use, so you can send and receive emails using an alias. It's kind of like a proxy for your email. There's a generous free plan to get started with Simple Login. It's open source, you can self-host it, and it's overall just a fantastic tool that I can't really live without, so check it out below. I don't think many of you will regret checking it out. All right, and we're gonna start this week with our highlight story, NordVPN and Surfshark are merging, continuing VPN consolidation trend. So I'm gonna start with the story, then some context, and then my thoughts, because this is kind of a bit to unpack. So the story itself, there have been negotiations between Surfshark and NordVPN starting in mid-2021. So this has been going on for probably about six months. Surfshark's communication head before this said that Surfshark wasn't developed with NordVPN as it's a completely different company. Even though we operate from the same country, NordVPN is our competitor. The news of the merger now turns that on its head, though the company will continue operating autonomously and, quote, rely on separate infrastructure and product roadmaps. Surfshark is, quote, legally bound not to share any information between the entities that would go against their terms of service or privacy policy. Therefore, they have no plans in doing so without notifying their customers in advance. The Surfshark CEO then went to say that consolidation in the market is a sign of the industry's maturity, but acknowledges that there are challenges ahead. Some context here. Yegor, the CEO of Winscribe, another VPN, actually predicted this a long time ago and wrote a blog article just recently talking about how the similarities between Surfshark and Nord have existed for a long time now. This also follows the trend in the VPN industry where countless services are controlled by just a select few. There's a VPN Pro article written that we'll also attach in the show notes going into this, and in that article that was written before any of this happened, they said, quote, don't be surprised if the company behind NordVPN makes another move in the near future. Again, all before this happened. My thoughts here, first, consolidation is not good. There's like, I can't think, and I'll ask Nathan, Nathan, can you think of a single positive for a consolidated VPN market for the average end user? No. <laughs> that, I, I can't Point either. Blank, no. I, I just can't, like I can't think of a good reason. Um, and the fact these companies are saying that it is a very much good thing is a red flag from the companies in my opinion, especially because they're not really justifying why it's a good thing. Second point, the VPN industry is scummy. And if you followed anything either Nate and I have covered in the last several years, this is not news to you. Third, NordVPN and Surfshark are now controlled by the same company. CyberGhost, ExpressVPN and PIA are also managed by the same company. And those are five of probably some of the most popular VPNs all managed by now two centralized companies. The takeaway today, migrate to a trusted VPN provider. Check out the Teclor VPN tools, teclor.tech slash VPN, and see why the top four services there are better than these. Seriously, iVPN, Mulvad, Winscribe, and Proton. They're all open source, they're all their own companies, and they all have things in place that none of these other companies have to respect your privacy. All right, with that, we're gonna move into our data breaches. We're gonna start with an unsecured AWS server, take your shot, that exposed three terabytes of information on airport employees. This was in Colombia and Peru, and exposed over 1 million files dating back to 2018, including employee records like ID card photos, names, national ID numbers, and more. This affected a handful of specific airports, El Dorado, Alfonso Bonilla, Jose Maria Cordova, remember, I am American, uh, Aeropuerto Internacional Jorge Chavez. I hope I did that right. <laughs> uh, yeah, those four airports were affected. This also included images of planes, fueling lines, and luggage handling, and images contained EXIF data, including the time and date, and in some cases, even the GPS location. So this is a lot of information. This came from a third party Swedish security company called Securitas. So this is probably affecting other organizations too, because you know, it's unlikely that they've failed to secure just this one bucket. There's probably others out there too. This is a trend I noticed this week when taking notes. It took uh, the researchers two tries before they got a response from Securitas. So they alerted them once, never heard back, alerted them again, and that's when they finally replied. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Next data breach, a Fortune 500 service provider says ransomware attack led to a leak of more than 500,000 social security numbers. Morley Companies, who provides, quote, business services to, quote, dozens of Fortune 500 companies, uh, was the person who was affected. So this attack began on August 1st. The company has not said why they waited so long to disclose this. And it's a good reminder that you may not always know when a data breach actually happens. So you might only find out months after. So make sure you always keep up with things. And we'll talk about what that means uh, very shortly. So this affected current and former employees and various clients. It included names, addresses, social security numbers, date of births, client ID numbers, medical diagnostic and treatment information, and health insurance information. <gasps> The total number of victims was 521,046. They really went down to the number there. So the company is offering credit monitoring and identity theft protection services and has set up a call center to answer questions. Again, make sure that you're really setting yourself up and minimizing the information you supply to companies, especially when you don't know when these data breaches could happen. So use alias information when you can, uh, avoid uh, handing over any information in the first place if you can avoid it, and also just make sure you keep up with all the data breaches that are happening as soon as they come out. There's a lot of other advice, but that's just some basic stuff. The next headline says, British Council exposed more than 100,000 files with student records. There's actually over 144,000. I don't know why they didn't put that in the headline. This comes from an unsecured Azure blob. Uh, number one, I don't know if that counts as a shot. It does. It, it does. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take your shot. Data included names, IDs, usernames, email address, and more. This blob was indexed by public search engines and could be viewed by anyone with no authentication in place. It took, again, two tries to get a response. And the second response, or the second try that got a response was from Twitter. So the researchers, again, reached out to these people and said, hey, your stuff's broken, never heard back, tweeted at them, and that's when it got fixed. So the reason I wanted to highlight that this week is because when that, like, that number kept popping up, it just shows you how poorly these companies take security, which is hilarious because every time there's a data breach, they always have a public statement that's like, we take the privacy and security of our customers very seriously, but we can't even be bothered to respond to security researchers that are trying to alert us. So yeah, just uh, remember, these companies will never care about your data as much as you will. So like Henry was saying, think about what you're handing over, try to obscure it, use masked email addresses like simple login, uh, random usernames, don't reuse usernames, just try to give them as little information as possible because they just don't care. Also, just want to emphasize, those are student records. Yeah, that makes it even worse. Yeah, like, th these weren't just adults, like these were student records, just to emphasize that. But think of the children. We need to ban encryption because the children aren't safe. <laughs> even though, remember the one time there was a data breach that exposed student addresses? <laughs> That actually happened multiple times. But but yes, Signal and WhatsApp are the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ugh. Okay, off my soapbox. Our next story comes from Switzerland, where the public transportation platform Postbus also exposed customer data. They use a program called Ticket Control, which is a management service for catching people who are trying to skip the fare. And it's online connected because if you've been identified and flagged, you are able to like contest the the ruling by uploading proof that you paid for a ticket. This vulnerability would allow attackers to essentially man in the middle data because of a quote, insecure direct object reference vulnerability. IDOR vulnerabilities are access control security issues that arise when an application has the capability to use user supplied input to influence objects directly, including database objects and static files. Okay, I think I had that wrong actually. I think it's basically the part where you can upload your proof that you paid, they can abuse that to extract data. So Postbus did actually fix this the first time they were contacted, thankfully, did not take two tries. Our last data breach story of the week, Telco is fined 9 million euros for hiding cyber attack impact to customer to customers. So this Greek data protection authority has imposed fines of almost 6 million euros, as well as 3 million. It's pretty much to two different, uh, uh, I think one of them is the parent company, that's why. Got it, okay, that makes more sense. And uh, yeah, pretty much- OTE, I think, is the parent company. Got it, thank you. So um, this was, uh, they were fined for leaking sensitive customer communication due to the cyber attack. The incident happened in 2020 and involved social engineering via LinkedIn, and then later brute forcing the target's credentials. Once in, they stole almost 50 gigabytes of data over five separate occasions, including rough location, age, gender, plans, ARPU of subscribers, IMEI and MZ and connected tower for subscribers and a lot more. So it was nice to see, I guess, something happen to a company that was affected by this and didn't alert their customers. That was kind of a theme this week. Lots of these companies were hesitant to uh, alert people of something that went wrong. And I actually like just kind of a thought experiment. Do you think that 
companies are discouraged to report data breaches because of fines. Do you think that's like kind of a, a double-edged sword of like imposing these strict regulations on these companies? I think companies are discouraged from reporting it because every time they do, they lose shares or they lose value. Like mm -hmm. every time a company reports a data breach, they get a hit in their their stock prices. And then on top of it, there's a, a betrayal of user trust because then users are like, oh, is this going to happen again? So I, I think in general, yes, they are widely unintentionally discouraged from reporting data breaches, which sucks because then you end up with these like Uber things where uh, I think it was Uber had like a driver's license leak back in like 2016 and we didn't find out for like five years. Yeah, but I, I all those things you said I agree with, but wouldn't strict fines only make that problem worse? I don't think so. Personally, it seems to me like companies have just come to accept fines as like a cost of doing business. Like there was a story, uh, I think last year, where Facebook was fined and they contested the fine not because they disagreed with the ruling, but because it was more money than they had set aside for the fine. And so, yeah, like a lot of these companies, I think the fines are just the cost of doing business. I think it's all the other things that just, I mean, I'm sure the fines don't help, but I don't think that is the main thing discouraging them. At least that's my opinion. On that note, we will move into companies. And we're gonna start with a story that uh, kind of made the rounds a little bit this week. It says Facebook's daily active users fell for the first time in 18 years since the company started. So, Facebook, it's unfortunately, it doesn't seem like a very big jump. Uh, Facebook used to have 1.93 billion active daily users. They now have 1.929 billion. Um, you know, still too many people using Facebook, but hey, it's a start. It's the first time ever they've lost users, which I think is great. Shares also fell by 20% of their value, which cost the company about 2 billion, or excuse me, $200 billion, which is awesome. It's funny because they are obviously trying to find something to blame. So they're blaming rivals like TikTok and YouTube, as well as less revenue from advertisers, specifically Apple's new privacy protections. The thing is like, I would look at this less as they actually have their daily active users fall because they're fundamentally the same number and just like, wow, they haven't seen growth, which is kind of, I mean, there's not, there's not much more to, gr to grow after 2 billion, which is like a quarter of the world and like a high percentage of the active world who uses the internet, but I don't know. We can look at this optimistically or the other direction as well. Well, I, I think it is worth looking at optimistically because one thing um, that I didn't put in the notes, but they pointed out in the article is they said like, basically they're not innovating anymore. Like Mark Zuckerberg pointed out or somebody from, from Meta pointed out, they're like, well, you know, we're, we're going to introduce, or we are introducing video content to compete with fa uh, YouTube and, and TikTok. But at the same time, they're like, you know, in the past, every time we've rolled out a new features like stories, I don't know if anybody remembers that, Facebook rolled out stories and all of a sudden everybody rolled out stories everywhere. And this is the first time that like Facebook is kind of on the defensive where somebody else has rolled out, like TikTok has rolled out these really short entertaining videos and now Facebook is trying to emulate it and everybody's just kind of like, all right, late to the party much, so. I don't know, if you're listening to this and you still have a Facebook account, Delete it. Delete it. Like, <laughs> and if you're not deleting it, at least limit your use. Don't be one of these daily active users in one of Facebook's metrics. Don't be 25% of the world is what we're asking you to do. Be the change you want to see on the internet. Yes. Our next story is a little less positive. It says AirTags with deactivated speakers are being sold on eBay and Etsy. Seller claims not for stocking. Title pretty much says it all. So for those who don't know, AirTags were built with little speakers, and if they are if they don't connect to the owner's device within a certain time frame, which I believe Apple recently shortened to as much as 24 hours, then they start making a noise, like a beep or a tone or something that just kind of lets people know, like, hey, I'm here, I might be being used for bad things, or I'm lost, who knows. Some people are removing the speakers and selling them online. Now, ostensibly, this does have some good uses. Like, one person in the article pointed out, they stick this on their bike, so if their bike ever gets stolen, now the criminal doesn't know that they're being tracked. However, it does not take a genius to figure out that this also has a lot of dark sides. Like now it's just gonna make the stalkers that are using AirTags even more effective because, I mean like someone like me, I leave Bluetooth turned off on my phone, so my phone will never alert me if there's an AirTag nearby. But yeah, that's a thing, beware. So um, a German petrol supply firm oil tanking was paralyzed by a cyber attack. So oil tanking in Mabinoft, 
I apologize in advance, um, are both subsidiaries of Mar Marcard and Balls. I'm really sorry, everyone. Um, they've been hit by a cyber attack that is limiting their ability to deliver uh, petrol to 233 shell stations in Germany. This did not affect the other 1900 shell stations in Germany. So while officials are not expecting any serious disruption, there are still concerns, and I think that we can all uh, see that this is kind of a rising issue, especially after the recent pipeline attacks that happened in the U.S. What, one, two years ago now? Shell has responded by rerouting to different suppliers for the time being. That was just last year, bro. You're talking about the Colonial Pipeline? Yeah. That was like four months ago. Damn. Hey, that's good. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, the next headline says, this company says it's developing a system that can recognize your face just from your DNA. This company is Coresight AI, and they are a facial recognition subsidiary of Cortica, who claims to be developing tools that can transform DNA evidence into facial reconstruction. They also claim to be developing a voice-to-face -face technology, which I think is kind of the same thing. It just takes voice recordings and says what your face might look like, and a gate recognition system. They are specifically marketing to government and law enforcement, shocker, and their uh, advisory board has only two members, former CIA director James Wol Wolsey and former assistant director of the FBI, Oliver Revel. So nothing to worry about there. Um, experts are saying there is no science to back this up, that this is only going to exacerbate all of the problems we already have with facial recognition, like ethical concerns, privacy concerns, and of course, racial bias. They are unsurprisingly not the first company to do something like this. In 2017, there was a company called Human, Long Human Longevity that claimed they develop a similar technology, though MIT and DNA company MyHeritage both disputed it. There's also a company that's currently in use in law enforcement called Parabon Nan Nanolabs, and they provide this DNA to physical description service to law enforcement. They claim they have helped solve an average of one case per week. They also caution that the images that they render and come up with should not be used in facial recognition technology because facial recognition algorithms are like very, very exact. And you know, like if the eyes, for example, are even like a, a couple nanometers further apart, then the facial recognition may not recognize it. There's a lot of concerns with these technologies. And the article points out, it's not so much about this particular company and this particular claim. It's more about pointing out that this is the trend that we're heading towards, which of course, longtime listeners know full well. This is the trend we're heading towards where people are, are very focused on having technology save us and do all the work. And they're not there's not a lot of oversight and there's not a lot of skepticism surrounding these technologies, unfortunately. So that is something to be aware of as we continue to move forward. And our final company article, Shaw has joined Firefox's trusted recursive resolver program. So Shaw Communications Incorporated is a Canadian ISP. They have partnered with Mozilla to provide Firefox users with DOH services, DNS over HTTPS. We think and assume that this means that they'll likely appear in the drop-down list of DNS over HTTPS providers in Firefox for Canadian users uh, sometime in the foreseeable future, but that's just our best guess. With that, we will move into researchers. This. This was another big story that got a lot of attention this week. Researchers use GPU fingerprinting to track users online. So this was a research team composed of citizens from France, Israel, and Australia. They used 2,550 devices and were able to fingerprint 1,605 of them for 28 days. According to the article, if I understood this correctly, the current average for like a single fingerprint is about 17.5 days. So this is a, a huge proof of concept with bad implications. Uh, they call this technique drawn apart, by the way. It uses WebGL and quote, short GLSL programs executed by the target GPU as part of the vertex shader to overcome the challenge of having random execution units handling the computations. Hence, the workload allocation is predictable and standardized, unquote. So in other words, they basically use WebGL and like short specific executions on the processor that they can use as a consistent benchmark to identify you. Fingerprinting GPU is particularly worrisome because unlike a lot of other common fingerprinting ele elements like your screen resolution or your time zone, hardware configurations like this are difficult to change or at least difficult to change regularly. Like you can change your time zone every day or you can change your screen resolution every hour, but you're probably not gonna pop off your computer and throw in a new GPU every week. This is really worrisome, and hopefully now that this research has come to light, it'll be something that uh, 
you know, in the endless cat and mouse, people will start to think about, well, how can we outsmart this and what can we do to prevent this? And our final research article for the week, more companies are using multi-factor authentication and hackers are looking for a way to beat it. Um, this is mainly just to illustrate that uh, multi-factor authentication is becoming more common and we know because attackers are starting to find ways to break it. So we recommend investing in a hardware key if you can, but at minimum, you should be using TOTP. And like, there's a whole TOTP guide on the TechLore channel if you want to look into that. All right, and with that, we're going to move into our politics section. We're going to start out with an unfortunate story. The Earn It Bill is back. So yes, unfortunately, Senators Blumenthal and Graham will not let this thing die, and they have brought it back again. For those who have missed all of this, the Earn It Bill is basically just a U.S. encryption backdoor. That's really what it comes down to. I forget what it stands for. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's a backdoor for only the good guys, which anybody with a modicum of common sense knows there's no such thing. Call, if you live in the US, do not email, call your politicians and tell them you oppose it. You probably won't get a hold of them personally, but you'll get a hold of their assistant and just say, I'm a voter in your district and I want to express that I hope they vote against the earn it bill and they'll take down, I think your name and your zip code is all they ask. Or, no, they didn't even ask for your name. I think they just asked for your zip code. So call your politicians, let them know that you oppose this thing, tell them to vote against it. And if you don't want to, not that this discounts what Nate just recommended, but if you if you just know you're not going to be calling people, at the very least, uh, donate to the EFF because they're also fighting a big legal battle um, about this right now. Yes. So that's like the, that's like the bare you. minimum you can do if you're not going to do that. Thank you. Yeah, five bucks here, ten bucks there. It adds up. Um, the next two stories are kind of linked, so I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, civil rights groups have launched an effort to stop the IRS use of the flawed ID.me facial recognition technology. The title says it all, the fight for the future and the algorithmic justice league. That's a cool name. Epic and others have launched dump ID.me. That's, that's the link dump ID.me as a petition to get the IRS to stop using ID.me. Um, and as of last week, I think we covered, they were planning to at least halt it until they decide what to do, but, uh, it's kind of unclear what's happening with that at the moment. You said Algorithmic Justice League is a really cool name. Um, the girl who started that is the focus of the Netflix documentary Coded Bias. And if you haven't seen that, I totally recommend it. It was a really good watch. Ah, very cool. Yeah, uh -um. super, super great. Yeah, that's And cool. it explains everything that's wrong with facial recognition. So 100% recommend for anyone who hasn't seen it. Yeah, and so the second story is kind of the unfortunate side of things. It's not just the IRS. The US government wants your selfies. So as the title says, it's not just the IRS, facial recognition is already in use with over 20 federal agencies in the form of login.gov, which is run by the General Services Administration using LexisNexis, cool name as well, uh, though not cool ambitions, and they offer no offline options. That doesn't even include all the state uh, specific state options it's like unemployment insurance and whatnot that's used uh, within each individual state so it's good that this is starting to get attention but you know like this is really kind of a deeper problem than just id.me on the irs website it seems like just facial recognition and things like this used on a lot of federal agencies and even some statewide agencies so we got to stay on top of this and it looks like this is kind of just the beginning of this fight and we're probably going to see this really start to unravel in the next six months or so I, sorry i i do want to add um I, I don't like I, I know we're very pessimistic here. I don't think the US government is sitting in the White House trying to figure out how to get people selfies. I don't think that's the goal here. I think the US government just isn't tech savvy and these companies are offering them the most convenient way to verify user identities. I think this is just the convenience thing. I don't think this isn't some like massive plot to get everyone selfies, but that doesn't discount that it's something that we need to take care of. And I think that like understanding why something's happening can help us better address why it's happening and really offer better alternatives to what's out there. That's what I wanted to add. And it sounds like Nate probably has something to say too. No, I was just gonna say, I agree. And it's, it's also a budgeting thing, like for reasons I will never understand. Um, when I was in the military and I was deployed overseas, I met a contractor who did my exact job. He was the civilian version of me. And he somehow made five times as much as I did, but somehow it is still cheaper to hire contractors. And I, I don't understand how that works, but it is, it's a fact. And so a lot of the time it's, you know, the government who most agencies are already underfunded because the federal government cannot manage a dollar to save their freaking lives. And so everybody's underfunded, but they're under increased pressure to like stop fraud and stop cyber attacks and stop this and stop that. And so they, out of necessity, they just turn to these third-party companies and go, here's a ton of money, you deal with it. 
And, you know, now they can say, well, these are experts and, you know, they're they're taking care of the system. We don't have any of the data. We don't have to manage it. And again, somehow that still turns out to be cheaper than actually hiring their own cybersecurity people. So, um, yeah, I'm with you. I don't I don't think it's malice. Like they already have the NSA and Facebook. They don't need to force us to take selfies just to submit our taxes or unemployment. But, yeah, that doesn't mean that it doesn't turn out to be a problem anyways. So. All right, and with that, we are gonna to turn to our neighbors to the north, Canada, where the Commons Ethics Committee wants cell phone data collection halted over privacy concerns. So on Monday, the House of Commons Ethics Committee passed a motion to suspend the public health agency's plans to collect data from millions of mobile phones as a way to understand travel patterns during the pandemic. This comes after the public health agency issued a new request back in December for proposals to track location data from cell towers all over the country. They are pumping the brakes on that one until they can have better assurances that this program will respect user privacy, which personally, I don't think that's possible, but at very least it might result in a slightly better system than what they currently are asking for. Up next, the Edmonton, the Edmonton police implement facial recognition technology to help fast track investigations. So the Canadian police are now using Neo face reveal to quick quote, more quickly identify suspects in criminal investigations. Police are not supposed to arrest based solely on facial recognition, though, which I guess is the more optimistic part of this story. I'm going to quote the police superintendent, Devin, my boy Devin. Um, he's addressing the possibility. Devin LaForce. Huh? LaForce, Devin LaForce. No, he's just my boy Devin. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You do you, bro. <laughs> so my superintendent boy Devin is addressing the possibility of privacy and security concerns from the public saying that the use of the new program adheres to all privacy laws and is conducted in a secure manner. Um, famous last words, as we like to say. So only a select group of trained technicians within the service will have access to the technology and police officers will have to submit their investiga investigative requests to this team. The database will only include mugshots from previously charged suspects and cannot, quote, monitor live streams or social media platforms. The system is already in place and it's being used to identify three suspects. So of all of the facial recognition technologies out there that we've seen, this, this does seem to be a slightly better one, but it still doesn't really address pretty much most concerns we have if, with facial recognition. Sorry, Devin, we gotta work this out some other time. <laughs> Okay, our next story comes from Germany and it's a slightly misleading headline. It says, Core orders websites to stop embedding Google fonts for GDPR headline. So the ruling, the exact wording of the ruling is this, quote, dynamic IP addresses represent personal data for the operator of a website because in the abstract, he has the legal means that could reasonably be used to, with the help of third parties, namely the competent authority and the internet, provide, uh, internet access provider, identify the person concerned based on the stored IP to or to have the address determined, unquote. So in other words, they're saying, IP addresses count as personal data because you can figure out who that IP address belongs to. As a result of this, a German court in Munich has determined that a specific website owner was violating GDPR by using Google Fonts. Because when you use Google Fonts, this allows Google to see the IP address of the user without user consent. From what I could tell from the article, they didn't explicitly order websites to stop embedding Google Fonts, but they did lay down the legal precedent that like, hey, this counts as personal data. So either you're gonna have to start getting user consent or you're gonna have to stop using Google Fonts. All right, and then our next story, I think also comes from Germany. Uh, it says that I am totally gonna butcher this name and I'm so sorry. There's a politician named uh, Renate, Renate Kunast, and she has won a, quote, important victory against Facebook agitators. The federal constitutional court has ruled in favor of Kunast in her dispute over insults directed at her. As a result, Facebook is likely to be obliged to hand over further data on users who insulted Kunast online to the Green Party politician. Basically, she is upset because people called her names on Facebook, and she has successfully convinced the court that now Meta has to hand over that user data so she can sue them. And I, I mean, for the record, if I'm wrong, go ahead and let me know in the comments. But from what I could tell from the article, these were just run of the mill comments that any politician should expect to get online, which I'm not saying that gives people an excuse to be crappy online. But I mean, this is kind of one of those things where like, I, I'm pretty sure we've gotten worse comments than what these people said about her, or at least I know I have. <laughs> so I, I don't I'm know. getting to good me, ideas. <laughs> <laughs> What, move to Germany? No, yeah, move to Germany, take YouTube so to court, and get all of you nasty commenters' <laughs> information. Oh, it's going to be great. We're going to make a, an epic... No, it's... 
seriously though, like like I said, I'm not I'm not trying to say that you know oh just suck it up and deal with it. But at the same time, it's like is it really worth violating people's civil liberties and privacy just because they called you some mean things online? Like get over it, man. Yeah, uh, and I guess like it's easy to to think of if you're not Ger like if you're German, you can probably very easily have the context behind this story. But I guess to kind of tie this story, we, we have a majority U.S. audience. Um, if you're in the U.S. The last presidential election, the 2020 election, pick <laughs> pick the candidate you don't like. Now imagine that candidate was going to court trying to sue social media companies to get the information of everyone who spoke against them. That's yeah. what this story is. And just literally spoke against them. Like, you know, I've, I've called candidates horrible names, usually moron. And, you know, like... It's, it's not even like they were conspiring to, you know, kidnap her or something. It's like they were literally just saying this person's an idiot. And the final article, a uh, SIM card registration act was approved, including mandate for social media users to register real identities. Not a great headline. So th this is in the, the Philippines. So the Philipp Philippine lawmakers have approved the SIM card registration act, which mandates the registration of prepaid SIM cards for electronic devices and social media accounts. The bill also has a section that mandates social media users to register their legal identities along with their phone numbers when creating new accounts. This move was made to aid authorities to track and dissuade the use of prepaid and postpaid SIM cards from criminal and fraudulent activities, as well as curb online trolling and disinformation from anonymous social media accounts that seem to proliferate their country. On a personal level, this is like not a vibe, because I like heavily, and many of us like very heavily rely on prepaid SIM cards, especially in the US where that's legal, in order to bypass a lot of this nonsense. Um, so this is definitely in a, like a bad thing for privacy. And it seems like a very, short-sighted approach to try to curb trolling and disinformation, in my opinion. That's gonna finish off politics. We're gonna move over to FOSS, free and open source. First article, Mozilla is adding multi-account containers to their VPN offering, which is actually really cool. I've, I'm a big critic of Mozilla VPN because it's just Molvad, um, but this is actually really cool. Um, for those who don't know, Firefox has containers so you can pretty much open tabs designed for just a specific use case and it's compartmentalized accordingly. So you can have one for personal, work, school, etc. This now directly integrates with Mo or not Molvad, Mozilla VPN so that you can have a tab on a per server basis and separate the IP address. Very cool feature. I'm glad that they actually took Mozilla VPN and integrated it with something to not just be a rebranded Molvad. So I'm now a little bit more open to the idea of Mozilla VPN with this feature. There's also a line at the end. Oh, thank you. They will also add multi-hop to the mobile versions of the browser. Okay, our next story comes from ProtonMail, who has introduced a new ProtonMail bridge. I have ProtonMail on the Linux side. It seems to have auto-updated, uh, which is nice, and installed the new bridge. So it was very seamless. I didn't have to re-log in, re-set up Thunderbird or anything. Honestly, it's basically just prettier looking from what I could tell. It's got all the same settings. It's got all the same stuff. It's just a more modern design. The only feature I saw that was new, at least from what I could tell, is now it gives you a snapshot of your storage space, which I don't really have a use for, but I, I guess some people would appreciate that. So, I mean, it looks nice. It's cool. And uh, Angry Henry has said, when are we getting ARM64 support? So, Henry smash. Yeah, no, this is, uh, I, I think you don't realize how terrible ARM support is for things until you're actually on a system that's ARM only. The next two stories are kind of linked together. They're about uh, open source vulnerabilities. The first one is a high severity vulnerability is found in the Element Desktop 1.9.6 and earlier. Element is a matrix client, for those who don't know. There was an issue with Electron and opening downloaded files that allowed for RCE under the right conditions. And Matrix described the exploit as complex, but they don't believe it's been used in the wild. Um, either way, you should update it if you use Matrix and you're on Element. And second, uh, they are finding vulnerabilities in open source projects. That's just the headline. The Open Source Security Foundation has announced $10 million in funding from a pool of tech and financial companies, including $5 million from Microsoft and Google, to find vulnerabilities in open source projects, which is very good. It's very exciting. And if you're asking why Microsoft and Google are donating to something like this, it's because that they're also dependent on a lot of open source projects. So they have a direct incentive to help um, a at least some open source projects. Also, like, a lot of Google's stuff is open source. People don't know that. Not like their web clients and the stuff that we complain about, but like if you're on Android, it's based on AOSP, which is open source. If you're on Chrome OS, it's based on Chromium OS. If you're on Chrome, it's based on Chromium. So there's normally like open source behind the scenes on a lot of Google's products. 
And with that, we will go into our misfits section. We have only three stories this week. We're going to start off with 277,000 routers exposed to eternal silence attacks via universal plug and play. I'm going to quote the article. A malicious campaign known as Eternal Silence is abusing universal plug and play, turning your router into a proxy server used to launch malicious attacks while hiding the location of the threat actors. Out of the 3.5 million UPnP routers found online, 277,000 are vulnerable to UPnP bleh, to UPN proxy and 45,000 of them have already been infected. So the moral here uh, keep your firmware updated. We talk about that all the time and turn off universal plug and play. I don't know when it will come out, but I am actually planning to do a Wi-Fi, uh, home Wi-Fi hardening guide because a lot of people ask, like, especially around the holidays, I think everybody got new routers and they were asking like, you know, what can I do to make my home Wi-Fi better? And so I'm, uh, soon I'm going to come out with a, a guide for that. And it's going to include things like turn off these settings in your router if you have them. So yeah, um, just turn off anything you're not using really. It's a good rule of light in general. Our next story, supermarket cameras to guess the age of alcohol buyers. We discussed a similar story in Canada last week. Now it's in the UK. Quote, tested on more than 125,000 faces aged six, aged six through 60, the algorithm on average guessed their age to within 2.2 years, 1.5 among 16 to 20 year olds. The article doesn't really go deep into privacy concerns, but there are plenty, of course. As always, the, the main thing I wanna know is what are they doing with the data? Who's keeping, how long are they keeping this data? Uh, how long are they keeping the the images? Like, are they gonna try and look for repeat offenders that keep showing up? It's just, and why, honestly? Like, are employees really losing that much time to carting people who look young? Like, And last but not least, a look at the new sugar ransomware demanding low ransoms. Uh, you can read the whole article, which we always encourage if you want to learn more about the details of this ransomware. The main thing I wanted to highlight is that this is a ransomware that is targeting individuals and not companies. Most ransomware we hear about is targeting companies, but this one is going after individuals and that's why they're demanding low ransoms because they're trying to make it something that the average person is more likely to be able to pay. So moral here, be on guard, keep good backups, keep your antivirus and stuff up to date, uh, don't click phishing links, all that good stuff. All right. And that was all our news for this report. Again, NordVPN and Surfshark have merged, Facebook has taken a massive hit, massive. Uh, the Earn It bill has returned, and there's a lot of exciting FOSS news, and really, this was a, a kind of a packed week. Um, so I hope you all listen because uh, lots of important stuff and a lot of things to follow going forward. Again, our promo this week is simple login. Uh, it's something that we use for the business. It's something I use for myself. It's something that a lot of people I talk to, I don't know if Nathan uses it, but like oh, a lot. Yeah. Of, all the time. Yeah, like pretty much everyone. like crazy. Yeah, like simple login, fantastic. Again, it's free to start. Um, actually, the free plan is extremely generous. Um, it's open source. You can self-host it yourself. Trust me, if you're the kind of person, especially who has like 10 emails for different things because you're trying to compartmentalize, just stop what you're doing, get simple login. It'll make your life so much better. That's because I was in that position before I started. And we want to thank you for listening to the surveillance support. We're just happy to know you're trying to stay safe out there. And the final thing we want to ask you to do is to share the podcast around. We really rely on word of mouth. Um, we don't really do much marketing or anything. So really make sure you're sharing this with people you know. And uh, yeah, make sure you stay subscribed and give us a rating if you're listening from a platform where that's an option. And that's really it. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you next week.